that um, but I'm happy to say hello everybody as every week so great to see you all and um, I'll just uh, mention again I haven't mentioned a long time that if you like to give some donation, some donation for uh, Geshema so Delit will uh, put the, the link in the chat box. Uh, so be, feel free to donate as much as you can and like and wish. And it's perfectly all right if you cannot do it. I'm very happy. We are very happy that we are all here to enjoy this uh, wonderful teachings. Thank you so much, Geshema, for your kindness. Mm. It's yours. Okay. Thank you. All right. Six o'clock. So let's start. All right. So focus on your breath and let go of any disruptive thought disruptive thoughts, any worry, anything that prevents you from being focused on this session. And then visualize in the space in front of you, Buddha Shakyamuni. As an object of refuge and, an, and someone who inspires and guides us. Surrounded by other great beings, like the masters from India, from Tibet, and all the other traditions. And so to get the greatest benefit out of this visualization, think that they are inseparable from your Lama or your Lamas. And then think that you're surrounded by all sentient beings seated all around you. Filling the entire horizon. all of them experiencing varying degrees of suffering, of grief, 
sadness, anxiety, and so on. All of them having their potential to purify their mind from all the obstructions. They all lack the interest or the ability to find path to that happiness. And so let's regard them with a deep felt sense of loving affection. an acceptance of all their shortcomings. And a sense of closeness. And that affectionate love then gives way to great compassion. The aspiration for each and every one of these beings to be liberated from suffering and its causes. And the wish may I be able to free them from whatever is in the way to their lasting happiness. May I lead them to the state of liberation. Liberation from suffering and its causes. Your great compassion then becomes the altruistic attitude, the determination, a courageous determination to lead all sentient beings to a state of lasting happiness free from any defilements. And that attitude then gives rise to bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. That in order to accomplish the welfare of all sentient beings, aspires to become fully enlightened.
and without letting go of this courageous determination. Let's recite the prayers. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And then in particular directed at all sentient beings surrounding us. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And then focusing on the Buddha and the great master surrounding the Buddha. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. And rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. And turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. All right, so let's start with the questions. Um, I got them from Dalit, she very kindly forwarded them to me. And I just go through them according to the well, the order that I received them, that is, well, sometimes it says from whom the question is. And if there's more than one question, I'll answer just one and go to the next question. And so in that way, everyone gets an answer to at least one of their questions, whoever is asked at least. All right. So the quest, the first question, question is from Elisheva Ayalon. Ayalon? I don't know if I said it correctly. It's about emptiness, first part of it. She asks, I guess it's a woman, right? Yeah. How do we know that wanting to understand emptiness and being in bodhicitta will not lead to the suffering that will result from the intense desire? So in other words, we know that intense desire can lead to great suffering. So when it comes to having intense desire for another person 
or from material objects, we know that can lead to great suffering. So how do we know this is not the case with regard to the desire to understand emptiness and the desire, I guess she means, to live bodhicitta. Okay. All right. Sorry, I started the questions right away. I didn't give you anything to do for this coming week, but I think that's all right <laughs> since we're coming towards the end. So anyway, you know how to practice the two together anyway now, bodhicitta and emptiness. Um, anyway, so how do we know that wanting to understand? Okay, so important question, definitely. Well, first of all, intense desire. What does intense desire mean? Is it a realistic kind of desire? Is it based on understanding or is it not based on an understanding? Is it, in other words, some kind of obsessive desire? When it is, when we have intense desire, let's say for another person or certain material possessions or a, a certain standing in society, reputation, and so forth. That kind of desire, I guess in most cases we can say, if not in all cases, comes along with an unrealistic view that this person or this material object or the status that we crave, that this gives us lasting happiness. And that without it, we cannot be happy. Now, that is definitely not in accordance with reality. I mean, another person can do for us only that much. Material objects are limited. Uh, high status, well, how happy can we really be, however high our status is? And, of course, based on the fact that it doesn't last, that the other person doesn't last, that... Um, the material object we crave or the, the status, etc. none of those last. We may be able to acquire them, obtain them for some time, but in the long term, well, they change into something else and we'll lose them again. So all this, this desire for these objects is not based on reality. This cannot provide us with lasting happiness. While an understanding of emptiness well, since our root cause, the root cause of that which prevents lasting happiness, which is suffering, since the root cause of our suffering is a misapprehension of reality, well, if we remove that root cause, we remove that which prevents us from being happy. And likewise, the mind of enlightenment, bodhicitta, again, as a counterforce to the self-centered attitude, which is also one of the main causes of suffering. So here, different to the person, to an ordinary person, usually we are uh, obsessed with an ordinary person, we're obsessed with material objects, as I mentioned earlier. So other than those, here, an understanding of emptiness and bodhicitta have the potential to reduce, in the case of bodhicitta, or totally eliminate What's in the way to lasting happiness? Which is not the case with regard to the person, etc. All right, that's one aspect. But intense desire can, of course, also be distorted in the sense not realistic, even when it comes to understanding emptiness and bodhicitta, in the sense that I decide now I won't do anything but sit down now and try and understand emptiness. I will not get up. I will not eat and not drink and not sleep until I've understood emptiness. And I will, from now on, only meditate on those two. <laughs> I mean, that would be a case where, although from the point of view of the object that I have intense desire for, kind of closeness towards these two or applying those two, are a means to achieving lasting happiness. But from the point of view of that aspiration or that desire in this case, well, it's mixed with an unrealistic sense of being able to accomplish this, of being able to accomplish the understanding of emptiness and so forth. So it's not based on wisdom. And well, I won't be able to succeed 
because uh, before long I will get tired or I'll starve, I'll uh, die of thirst and so forth. And so it's important to have desire, to have a wish, first of all, that's based on reality, to take a break when I need to take a break, to accumulate the causes and conditions that are necessary to be able to dedicate myself to an understanding of emptiness or develop to developing an understanding of emptiness and to practicing bodhicitta, to apply the, the to generate the causes and conditions. And that I can only do if I have an understanding of what they are, such so as study the Dharma to a certain degree that I get the understanding, what is that, what do I need to do to be able to practice this effectively without dying of hunger and thirst, as an example. So yes, you can know, therefore, intense desire, like I said, it's important to understand intense desire in the in the in the way we should apply this desire, we should develop this desire, is a desire that's based on wisdom. And then we take our time, not too much time, but we don't overdo it. We try to find a balance in which we understand emptiness and bodhicitta and so forth. And the only way you can find out is to actually try it. The only way to, to find out in the long term Will this lead to suffering or will I be happier? Well, just try it out. That's the best way to find out. Yeah, so that's um, my answer to that first question. Um, yes, so to, to, to kind of apply those two as much as you can. And, well, as it is the case for those who've actually practiced, just from them reporting back to us, it's actually help them i mean initially just with the initial um practice of these i mean just you know weak practice of those not really intense like a bodhisattva but it still has given them more satisfaction and more happiness and that in turn has motivated them to continue on so see whether that is true for you as well but the beginning is the hardest to actually start and find your practice. That's the hardest part. I've already mentioned that. I think something that Geshe Tutan Pelsang has once said in one of his teachings. When we start off with practicing the Dharma, and practicing the Dharma means practicing emptiness, practicing bodhicitta. It's like we're starting to travel somewhere else when we're in the middle of a jungle. So as we start, maybe cycle, ride a bicycle if you like so when we start off we're like riding this bicycle through a jungle there are like roots and and branches and potholes and all sorts of obstacles on the way it's really hard to to come into this this flow and and to be be able to get some kind of continuity when it comes to our practice but slowly that changes that path is no longer this jungle we then come to some kind of i don't know road that is that is it's still got some potholes and stuff but it's no longer has branches and, and roots and so forth obstructing us until we reach the highway and that's when the right becomes pretty smooth and that is the that is really the the way someone practices who's more advanced so it's really in the beginning when it's most difficult and once you find your own practice and you you get into that kind of habit you become more familiar with it it becomes easier and easier okay all right so that's the first question then that's well, let me just make sure i don't I just want to mark it okay that is elisheva's first question and then there's the second the second is that also from elisheva yes i think i think why, why does samsara exist and for what? Is that still Elisheva's question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, and then the third one, is that also from Elisheva? No. Okay, so then the third one. Uh, it's from someone. I don't know from, it doesn't say by whom it is, from whom it is. Anyway, so the question is, how if at all does his home is the Dalai Lama and other scholars relate to the paradox in Western psychology? The paradox of having mental therapy without being able to assume a distinct mind that can be treated. Okay, so there's a, a paradox here. You apply mental therapy, 
but there's no distinct mind that you can apply it to. So that seems to be a paradox. How does this holiness and how do other scholars relate to that? I don't know what his holiness would say. I don't know what other scholars would say uh, or what scholars, yeah, other than his holiness would say. Well, in my opinion, well, first of all, I would have to ask, what does a distinct mind mean? What do you mean with a distinct mind? Uh, if the person is there and would like to clarify what they mean, you're welcome to. It's me. I'm a little bit embarrassed because it's, oh, it's your from, okay. from a few weeks or months. So I don't remember. Uh, I wasn't sure that uh, this question will s still be there. So I, I don't remember what did I meant there. Oh, never so mind. You, it's okay. Sorry for this. No, no, no worries. Okay, well, maybe you can still try to answer it. I mean, because someone else may feel, still think like, what is the distinct, there's no kind of concrete mind there. I mean, in Buddhism, you have many different mental states. You don't even have something concrete that you can see or touch or feel. I cannot even know that you have a mind. I can know my own mind, but for all I know, you could all be zombies and not have a mind, right? I mean, I can't know your mind. Um, and so how does that work? Well, I mean, this is not just true from the point of view of the mind. It's true for the body as well, to a certain degree. Okay, we can say, I see the body. But really, honestly, my own body, I can feel. I can feel. I can see it, yes, well, to a certain degree. I see parts from a different perspective than you do you see other parts that i can't see but we're pretty much limited in that we cannot really see inside and through of course modern technology we may be able to get a, a like a, a, a scan or what have you but that doesn't give us the exact picture of what's going on inside and then if you treat me you don't know how that feels in my body right so i mean we're like a doctor it's also pretty much in the dark in the end. It's like hoping that it will help, hoping this medicine will help. And oftentimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. And still, we should try. Still, we should try. So the body is still a mystery for us. Okay, it's slightly easier with the body since it's a physical object, and therefore we have sense consciousnesses that can help us to understand it. But even there are limitations. So with regard to the mind, you know your own mind, I know my own mind to a certain degree again, of course. A lot of what happens on the mental basis is subconscious. But still, what we do know is again, yes, it's kind of limited. But if the methods are helpful, well, then it makes sense if we are able to live with less anxiety, with more I don't know, satisfaction and so forth. If it works, then it doesn't matter if the mind is not as distinct as distinct as we would like it. Um, it's not like a nail on which you can just, you know, take a hammer and you just nail it and it's on the wall and that's end at the end of it. It doesn't work in that way. But even if it's not as distinct and and concrete as we may feel, if it works, it makes sense to apply it. So that's what I that's my answer to that question. All right, then question number four is from Jimmy, from Jimmy, Jimmy Smith. All right, so he's got quite a few questions and then some of these belong together. So I just go through them. What is the meaning of the word emanation or emanating? Um, he says in the, in the Oxford Dictionary, emanating means to originate from, to be produced by. Is that the same as the Tibetan term? Well, Dua, as in like emanate, that's how it's translated. Dua, as in the word duku uh, in Tibetan, like a duku is uh, someone who is a recognized reincarnation of, um, yeah, of a, of a spiritually advanced person. So like a recognized reincarnation, let's say of a lama or like, a, you know, spiritual guide. Um, of course, the word duku cannot be taken literally because Tuku is actually another word for emanation body, like a emanation body of a Buddha, like a Buddha 
who has just emanated that. So here is just a, it's just an honorific in in a sense that not every recognized reincarnation is is of course a tuku. I mean, of course it it could just be uh, bodhisattvas or not even. Uh, they don't even have to be that highly advanced. I mean, anyone, one of my teachers once said, anyone can be recognized as the reincarnation of someone if you make an effort. Um, if someone, if there's the person who does the recognizing has certain higher perceptions, they can recognize someone to be the reincarnation of this person or that person, but they just don't do it because there's no great benefit. Whereas there's great benefit if there's a lama. Anyway. Never mind, you know, not without going into that. I'm just saying that a reincarnation is not less a, a, like a, a duku in that sense is not someone who's actually emanated anything. Okay, doesn't have to. I mean, could be, doesn't have to be. But again, what does the does it mean to emanate, to just originate from, and to be produced by? No, no. There's there's more to it. Um, but let's just. Well, I might not if that's the part. Oh, well, I should answer it to some degree. Well, I'll try. So um, to emanate, it's the ability of the mind from the path of seeing onwards, really. Once you realize emptiness directly, uh, that's when you can emanate, well, certain physical appearances, um, you can emanate, well, mainly that kind of physical appearances. The mind is already there. So you emanate certain, yeah, well, appearances in the form of a, a person with a certain body or even physical objects if they benefit other sentient beings. So for a bodhisattva on the path of seeing, and of course for a Buddha anyway, they're able to produce these these objects but again out of their direct realization of emptiness and out of their motivation of bodhicitta the, the power of their mind is such that they can actually make these objects appear out of well out of nothing if you like i mean you don't necessarily need to have the causes and conditions that we would need to emanate let's say the classic example, the, when a bridge is needed, a Buddha emanates a bridge. Well, if I want to get a bridge, I need to, you know, build the bridge. Um, I cannot emanate. I cannot produce it in any other way. Whereas a Bodhisattva can actually make it spontaneously or a Buddha, Buddha in particular, spontaneously make it appear. But how does that work? Scientifically, I'm sure there's a scientific explanation, but I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, there must be some science behind it. I mean, there's some causes and conditions, etc. But what exactly it is? All I can tell you that it's the mind of, it's, it's really the mental ability of a certain being. Would our dream body, he asked, be an example of an emanation? No, I don't think that is like an example of an emanation. A dream body, of course, appears and arises, but not uh, but out of the ordinary causes and conditions that we have as ordinary beings who are controlled by karma and, and afflictions, whereas an emanation in the sense of the truku and the sense of the emanation by a Buddha arises not from karma and afflictions um, as part of having this body that is the cause that is the uh, that was caused by karma and affliction, but rather comes out of the wisdom and the great compassion of um, an enlightened being in the case of enlightened beings emanation so here's just something that arises well at night if yes what is it emanated by no i wouldn't say it's emanated and then subtle energy is subtle energy physical or mental it's physical mind or body um well it's part of the body part of the body but it's that part that also goes from one life to the next and he's here talking about tantra uh, and so within tantra um yes yeah, so these subtle energies they are also said to be when it comes to and this is part of his question so emanation as in when you emanate a physical um a physical phenomenon although i said it's the mind that is mainly responsible but the substantial cause for that are the subtle energies which is physical so out of these subtle energies a body arises. 
Uh, so, for instance, in Tantra, you talk about an illusory body that emanates even before, that arises even uh, before someone is enlightened. So that's an emanation in that sense. And that comes from the subtle energies. And so, yeah, anyway, the subtle energies are physical. So about bodhisattvas emanating therefore various bodies, would they emanate from their mind? Well, yes, the mind and the subtle energy. And are we emanating right now one single body from our mind that we consider as our own body? No, we don't emanate from our mind. We wouldn't use the word emanate. It's because of karma and afflictions. There's no control. It's not like something we are, we, we are controlled in a controlled fashion are producing if you like i mean we're just thrown into it because of our actions of this life when we die well it is our mind of course but there's not this process of, of, of emanation as i said you need wisdom and, and the motivation to benefit others so the, as examples of like the causes for for emanating in our case it's like the wish to benefit myself and ignorance and so my body does certainly not an emanation how does it happen well if you learn about like the the process of like when we die our mind is drawn to, through the karma i mean it's not like in a controlled fashion it's because of our karmic imprints we're drawn to a certain um situation such as let's say our parents um being in sexual union as an example so we're reborn as a human and we're drawn into this and because of this connection we have then we enter this fertilized egg so our body really enters another physical entity instead of emanating, producing its own. How are we doing it with one body? Can we actually analyze this process? Yeah, I think we can analyze this process the way I just did, I, I hope. I mean, I hope in a satisfactory way. Um, yes, that we take on a body as opposed to emanate a body, kind of a body arising from ourselves to benefit others. Yeah, so that would be my answer. I hope this was, uh, I answered your question with this. Um, that is that. Um, everything else, I think all these other questions are, um, I'll answer them later. They're also, by, they're also from Jimmy. And then the fifth question is from Tao City about dream yoga. So he said this, uh, Glenn is trained in Geluk tradition and I'm very found to. I don't know what that means. I'm very found to. Mostly, I like him for saying I'm not interested in religion, but in enlightenment. And then his question is dream yoga. Is it possible for practitioners to meet in dream yoga? All right, dream yoga. Um, now, dream yoga, um, of course, well, of course, means it's like, I don't know that much about dream yoga, to be honest. I mean, I, I know very little about it. Um, it's part of the, it's, it's a tantric practice. And these very specific practices associated with certain deities and so forth, of course, they're kept secret. Um, so they're not widely available. And I really just know what is usually available um, in the texts. So dream yoga, really the point of dream yoga is to utilize subtler levels of consciousness as well at least the highest yoga tantra is all about utilizing subtler levels of of the mind the subtlest level of course being the clear light mind at the time of death um but it, at least initially you can only utilize it when you die so <laughs> it's the last time you can use it in this very life therefore you utilize other types of awareness that are not as subtle as the clear light mind of death, but slightly coarser, but not as coarse as our uh, mind at the time when we are awake. Um, and that is the dreaming mind. And is it possible for practitioners to meet in dream yoga? Mm, I mean, well, when in dream yoga, you manifest a dream body, of course, then you could you, of course, I'm just saying, I don't know, if you manifest a dream body, you could theoretically meet 
but why would you do that? Why would you just meet when you're awake? Um, I don't know. I don't see the purpose uh, for meeting, but maybe if there was a certain meeting, like maybe your teacher would manifest a body and you would manifest a body and you would meet in a dream to receive teachings, which because of the, for whatever reason, you can't do in ordinary life. Well, yeah, maybe you can meet. I don't know. It would make sense that you can if you manifest that dream body, but I don't know. How do they know they're not dreaming? How do they know that? But they are dreaming. <laughs> if they meet in a dream body, they are dreaming. Oh, how do they know they're not dreaming? I mean, they're not just making it up. Um, I don't know. How do we know that I'm actually meeting someone uh, and I'm not dreaming, just dreaming it? Um, how do I know exactly I'm really talking to you guys? I mean... I hope I'm right about this, but I cannot prove it 100%. But it seems pretty real, I guess, in a similar way. How does controlling the dream help us understand what the mind is? Well, like I said, dealing with subtler levels of consciousness. I mean, for us, it's really hard to control the coarse mind as it is. That's why tantric practice, of course, is quite advanced. Advanced in the sense that a tantric practitioner quite advanced, very advanced. So a tantric practitioner who practices, for instance, while well, utilizing these subtle stages of mind, they have already a great sense of control of their course mind. And so now they're going deeper into the subtler levels of mind to be able, of course, eventually to control their subtlest mind, the subtle clear light mind, uh, by being able to use this mind to focus on emptiness. That's really the goal of, um, of utilizing these subtler levels, to use that type of mind um, to then realize emptiness with it. And, and, and the dream yoga, these are all like a preparation for, for that, so to say in general. Then there are more questions about the dream. Hmm. Would you agree to Shatman and expand on the difference between the Western and Tibetan conception according to this? Uh, what is the reason for the dream? Why do we dream? Why do we dream? I don't know why we dream. Why? I mean, I, I, I have a personal opinion about it. I don't, but I don't know. Um, I, I, I've, I just, I've just kind of, Thinking of someone like Lama Zoparimpache, for instance. Lama Zoparimpache, who is known not to sleep. And I think I may have told you this story. I witnessed this myself in one situation. Actually, the most obvious, well, it was probably twice, but the most obvious was in one situation where Rinpoche taught all night, the whole night, he, he gave a teaching. And I, I happened to have a friend who took me to this teaching and she had requested it. And Richard taught us, us and two other people, um, all night, through, the whole night. And then at five, he told us to go home um, because he had to do his prayers. He taught until five o'clock. And then he asked us to, 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 well, to leave him. He didn't say go home, but, you know, leave him for an hour. He had to do his prayers and come back at six. And so we did. We were like so exhausted. But Rinpoche didn't manifest any exhaustion, nothing. And an hour later, we were back and Rinpoche continued to teach. And by that time, we were like, Ugh. we we're so tired. And Rinpoche was, I mean, you can't fake that if you're really exhausted. And Rinpoche went on the, the whole day. The next day, he was like meeting people and it was just as fresh. And we were like, we we're like almost collapsing until we finally went to bed. And Rinpoche didn't. So Rinpoche doesn't sleep. Therefore, if he doesn't sleep, why do we need to sleep? And why does Rinpoche not have to sleep? So my theory on sleep in general is that probably Rinpoche's mind is not as coarse as our mind. I'm just talking from the point of view of my perception. I'm, I'm not talking about Rinpoche being a Buddha and so forth. Let's say Rinpoche, he, he's a Bodhisattva. Let's say he's a Bodhisattva. Um, definitely a Bodhisattva. But I mean, yeah, so from the point of view of being a Bodhisattva, on which level, I don't know. But on a certain level, when he 
has, um, he no longer utilizes the coarser types of mind that we do. So since our minds are so coarse, I mean, our afflictions, it's so exhausting. It is just so exhausting. I mean, like if you've been angry a whole day, how exhausting is that? And even without being angry, our coarse self-centeredness and our coarse thoughts, all kind of influenced by afflictive emotions. I mean, it doesn't have to be anger, but just attachment and desire and so forth. It's just exhausting. And we need this break, I guess, for the subtler minds, including the dream mind to arise. Whereas a person who's always in that subtle state, they don't need that break, right? Don't need that break. So yeah, I see it that way, but I'm not sure that's true. So why do we dream? Well, exactly. It's kind of a way to digest almost the stuff that we go through throughout the day to um, have a subtler awareness that, I don't know, it's not necessarily restful, maybe even if it's a nightmare, but somehow we can maybe work through it or I don't even know there's a great purpose. We just go through it in that way. I don't know. What is the effect of the dream on the dreamer's health physically and mentally? Well, it just all depends. Um, I'm sure there are dreams that are, healthy and their dreams that are not healthy but i mean the main cause for them being unhealthy is now awakened state to be found in awakened state in the case of trauma for instance so it, it's just a manifestation of that trauma in a in a dream but i'm not saying it's it's healthy the meaning of the dream is there a difference between the perception of the ther therapeutic aspect and the personal point of view um the meaning of the dream I don't know the meaning of the dream. Is there a difference between the perception of the, I don't know anything about the therapeutic aspect of a dream and the personal point of view. I mean, from a Buddhist point of view, dreams are not considered to be that important. When you are highly realized and you have a certain dream, well, yeah, that can be meaningful. It can be a, a prophetic, like a, a prophetic, like a, a dream where you have like a, prophecy like where you dream about what's going to happen and it can be very significant but in ordinary people they're they're not really meaningful as such i mean in the end they're all that they're just that they're just dreams they can be maybe beneficial if like i said you know something happens and you suddenly realize in your dream that you haven't uh dealt with the situation effectively and through your dreams if you become aware of that then it can be can be beneficial but most of our dreams we don't even remember. I mean, in my case, at least, I, I don't remember most of my dreams. Ways of dealing with types of dreams. There are division into types of dreams. Not according to Buddhism. According to Western medicine, also a fetus in the womb of its mother is found in the ram sleep. What is the bohemian conception of pregnancy and dream time? I don't know. Uh, I don't know the bohemian conception of that. Um, in Buddhist teachings, the concept of a dream is often used as an illustration of the idea of awakening. Um, well, the concept of a dream is not used as the analogy of awakening, but the analogy of the unawakened state. Awakening, I mean, then waking up from the dream, that is then uh, the analogy for or the metaphor for awakening from ignorance. So in a dream, things appear one way and exist in a different way. We believe this is reality, whereas it's not. So dreams are used to uh, describe our sense of reality. It's like we're all dreaming. And of course, eliminating ignorance is like waking up. Do dreams in the Buddhist world have any more meaning? Well, they serve as an analogy and they serve as a metaphor. And as I said earlier, um, they... Um, can also be utilized for meditative practice. All right, so I hope I've answered all this. This is all part of one question, so I didn't want to break it up because otherwise um, I'll forget uh, to answer everything else. So I hope I've been able to answer a little bit. I've, I've not been able to answer it fully, and I think it's better um, for you, Tao City, to ask someone who knows better about this. I really don't know much about it. So usually qualified lamas who have a good knowledge have a thorough understanding especially of tantra uh, they can definitely give you a better answer and of course anyone else um, who's got a good background of buddhism can give you a better answer all right then 
The next question is this the sixth one is that about the mirror analogy is that also by Tau Seti? Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I apologize but I don't remember who wrote it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Uh, is the mind taking up the aspect of its object? It's about the mirror analogy. Okay. So does the mind take up the aspect of its object that's a difficult one yes it does it takes up the aspect takes takes on the aspect of its object so it's usually explained that like a mirror our mind is like a mirror um here is the mirror analogy it has its own substance while the mind has no substance well yeah it's just an analogy i mean it's the mirror of course is something physical if with substance you mean something physical so in the, the when it comes to the mirror analogy yes you have a physical object while the mind is not physical but there is some similarity here uh, so if it takes on the aspect of its object without there being a separate mind so it's not exactly the same as the mirror no it's not exactly the same of the mirror of course not you have like a separate concrete mirror but you don't really have a separate mind I mean, well, the aspect or the reflection in the mirror is also not separate from the mirror and the mind is not separate from that aspect. But what does it actually mean to take on the aspect of an object? Well, it's really just the appearance of the object, right? It takes on the aspect in the sense that, well, um, if you think of a, yeah, it's like if you take the mirror example, the, the mirror analogy of like, something appears in the mirror like uh, i don't know blue or the shape of a of a vase for instance when the vase is reflected in the mirror so similarly it's said that in the mind to the mind a vase appears now with a mental consciousness that's not that's not difficult to understand for instance if you if i ask you to think of a vase right just or I tell you, don't think of a bus. <laughs> so you're going to think of a bus, right? I mean, like when, if I ask you, well, think of a bus. So while you listen to me, even while I, while I talk to you, I can think of a bus. So we can actually, you know, the mind can do, maybe not simultaneously, but switch back and forth quickly. So what appears to your mind? A bus. So your mind takes on the aspect of a bus. What that looks like, well, for our mind it's individually different but it still takes on the aspect of the bus and then if we let's say we were all in the same room and we would all look at a bus with our eye consciousness and again the eye consciousness um, takes on the aspect of that bus for all of us it will be slightly different because we would be standing in different places we even if we were like on top of each other but that would still mean um, we would be still in slightly different places and we get a slightly different perspective of that bus. So first of all, it'd be a different perspective. But other than that, we have a very similar appearance of that bus, but it still has to appear to the mind um, because the vase doesn't enter your mind and you can still know its shape and color. So your mind, therefore, takes on the aspect of the bus. So it's like a mirror, it's reflected in your mind. Of course, by way of the sense faculty. The sense faculty first takes on the aspect of the object. And here we can take the scientific explanation in terms of retina and so forth. And then it appears to the mind. It appears to us, even if it's over there, even if the vase is over there, we don't need to touch it. And still, <coughs> it's almost like a, like a photograph in our mind. No, it's not like a photo, but it's like it's reflected in our mind. It's it's appears to our mind. Okay. So if it's is it's all just one aspect after another aspect and so on, we without the mind being a separate thing as a mirror would be. I'm not sure I understand that question. So one aspect after the other, yes, the the, the object is is as we continue to look at it it continues to appear to the mind. I mean, the object's changing, of course. Uh, we're not aware of those subtle changes. So moment by moment, it appears to the to the eye consciousness as we continue to look at it uh, without the mind being a separate thing. Um, separate, of course, it's separate from the appearance, but they cannot, 
it's not like you can separate the mind that looks at this vase and the vase. You cannot actually separate them literally just as your reflection in a mirror and a mirror cannot be separated so likewise you can't separate the mind but they're still different objects they're different objects or they're different phenomena you have the mind and you have that which is appearing to the mind but that appearance and the mind that cannot be separated in in that situation when the eye consciousness perceives the vast i mean as the appearance of the vast and that mind in that moment Furthermore, is this why the fundamental mind is also called clear light? Because it can take on any colors and shapes without having its own color or shape. Therefore, it is like clear light. Um, huh. I, I mean, clear light, it's clear. I mean, it's like saying it's luminous. It's not really described as clear light. I mean, the clear light mind, that's different. It's a very subtle mind. But clear, it's described as clear. Um in like a, if you have a clear mirror anything can appear to it so similarly yes so the mind is described as clear because anything can appear to it and it's the continuum that can be imputed on these individual events of taking on various changes various changing aspects the actual self is the continuum no like you're talking about the continuum of consciousness taking on to which different things appear so you have the mental consciousness to which things appear you have the sense consciousnesses and something always appears to the mind so you have different minds i mean you always have a mental consciousness to which something appears and you always have sense consciousnesses to which something appears but we're just not aware of that we were too occupied with like focusing just on some sense objects or on what we're thinking about so objects just appear, but we may not, it's like there may not be a, a, an ascertainment of what appears. So therefore, there are many different minds, but there's just one self. So the self is merely labeled. It's merely labeled on the basis of these different consciousnesses to which different things appear. So it's the actual self. The actual self is not, it's not the basis of imputation well the mind is just the basis based on which we then say self so when the eye consciousness sees the vase we label i see vas. so based on that we label i is there an i that can be found a conventional or just a self that can be found other than the one that is labeled in that situation no and then when the when the mental consciousness thinks about the vas, we also say correctly, I think of the mental, I think of the vas. In this case, it's it's labeled on the basis of the mental consciousness. In the first case, it was in the first case, it was labeled on the basis of the eye consciousness. So the the basis of designation, that is kind of the main basis that may change. But based on that, I label I think about vas. I see the vast and so forth so none of these these awarenesses are the self itself they're not the i they're the basis based on which i label i the true self that actually exists the true self what do you mean with the true self uh, there's only a conventional self a true self strictly speaking would be an inherent self, according to the present Giga school, and that is impossible. A self that exists besides that imputation, or whether you whether you impute or label I on the basis of the I consciousness or not, or on the basis of any aggregate or not, a self that's really there from the side, somewhere here in the within mind and body. If that existed, you'd have an inherent I. That doesn't exist. How does it exist? Well, it doesn't. It is it. It exists in name only. It says, as Nagarjuna says in the letter, in the verse of letter to a friend. Yes, there is no true self. It doesn't exist. Therefore, the self that does exist is the conventional eye that is merely labeled. Then attain the high rank which is beyond the perishable world. Name only, fearless in its peace, unaging, never possessing a flaw. Um, well. I'd have to read what that really means. Then attain the high rank. 
the high rank, which is beyond the perishable world. It's not talking about the I, it's talking about this high rank, about enlightenment, name only, fearless in its space. So I have to read this uh, a, yeah, on another translation. Attain the faultless, ageless, fearless stage, which is peaceful, peaceful, only nominal and transcendent. Yeah, so here he's not talking about the self, but he's talking about the state of, well, I guess, Buddhahood, ageless, fearless state, peaceful, only nominal and nominal and transcendent. So here he's talking about the state of enlightenment, which is also merely labeled, but conventionally it exists and it doesn't change into something else. Ageless, it's not like it degenerates as ordinary beings as they age, they degenerate their their senses degenerate, etc. It's faultless, it's fearless, it's peaceful, but it's also just nominal. Nominal. It's also merely labeled. So it's not just the self, but also the state of awakening. Is Nagarjuna referring to this in his last verse? No, I don't think he's referring to the self. I think he's referring to enlightenment. Okay, so for those who have all these many other questions that are part of it, um, yeah, they get to get more answers but i don't want to like i said i don't want to split it up and then in the end anyway all of your questions will be answered then the seventh question is from varda is and what is the connection if any between the way the mind designates an object logic in, in brackets because it's not any other objects and the diamond slivers as posited by the Prasangika. Um, okay. What is the connection, if any, between the way the mind designates an object? I think I have to rephrase it. Leave it yes, be. Please. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sure. Okay. It, yes. It's a long time ago, so I ah. have to... Okay. Sure. Please do it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. For, Thank for you. Next time. Okay. Then there are more questions. His Holiness, on a great teaching, he man she mentioned that he keeps stressing smiling. The question is, what is the effect of a smile on the mind? And does this influence also extend to the dream yoga? <laughs> Oops. Same person. Uh, does this influence also extend to the dream yoga? And what is the influence? Smiling is so underrated as practice, yet so strong in the effect. Mostly use the combination of smile yoga with metta, both enforcing each other. Yes, metta is not a Mayana technique, but the Buddha himself did teach it. And I find this very reasoning in developing, resonating. I find this very resonating in developing love and compassion. What, who are these questions by? This is that you don't know, right? No, okay, never mind. All right. Um, yeah, about the smile. Um, well, yeah, I guess I guess psychologically, I've heard that that smiling when when things go really stressful and when when we can't manage and so forth, I've heard that just psychologically, it's very helpful in that moment just to smile because our mind is such that when we smile, usually our mind is calm and maybe, Although it's usually the other way around, when we're calm and happy, we smile. And, and so that's usually the mechanics of smiling, as there's a cause of a calmer and happier and loving mind. But then this this is usually the cause that gives rise to the smile. But psychologically, apparently, it helps to smile because it triggers that mind that is usually associated with the smile. So it can be beneficial. How it extends to dream yoga, I don't know. How can it influence dream yoga? I mean, just smiling won't be enough. Of course, there's a whole practice behind it. Um, smiling is so underrated. I mean, it's nice to when you're going around with other people and, and you know, you have a friendly face. I mean, you don't have to go like grinning, <laughs> walking around town just grinning. I mean, that's like probably just annoying people. But, um, you know, sometimes we have this frowning face. Um, I noticed... One person, of course, is homeless, um, but uh, even without talking about his homeless, there are certain people who just have like a, a hint of a smile and just looking at them is very pleasant. So one person that comes to comes to mind is Tupton Jimba, Geshe Tupton Jimba. 
I, whenever I see him and I don't meet him directly, I see him in photographs or maybe in videos or what have you, he always seems to have the, a hint of a smile. And it's just nice to look at him. He looks like a, a happy person, a satisfied person, like a, and it's 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 just nice to see that. And there are some people who who kind of almost carry a smile on their face. But I'm not talking about kind of faking it here, you know. But it's still important to to develop an inner state such that allows you to carry that smile because it's, you know, if when you meet a person to me, to the gym by someone and I see him. It also makes me want to smile. I don't know. It's got nothing to do with what he does and so forth, of course, besides all the great work he does. But yeah, and so he's just an example. But there are other people like that who have a sincere smile. And it's nice. It's like, yeah. And of course, if you smile at people and are friendly and all that. Yeah. So I, I think he's got a good point there. So meta, of course, meta, which is love. Um um, it's not, yeah, the word is not used so much in the Mahayana tradition, but of course, love, of course, uh, is definitely, well, metta, the Sanskrit, the Pali word is not, well, it's the Sanskrit is the same, metta, I guess. Uh, so yes, it's, 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 as, as to this term, metta is used more in the Pali tradition, in the Tibetan tradition the word is used less i mean that pali word or the sanskrit word is used less but of course love is still um a very important mental factor that is emphasized a lot unless i get the word meta wrong it means something else but as far as i know it means love karuna compassion meta love isn't that right am i right is meta does meta mean love right is the word Chamba in Tibetan, I thought. Anyway, okay. Uh, so, all right. Um, and then the next question is definitely by the same person. So I go back to the, the top of the page. Okay. Then Elisheva's second question is about the eye. Has the accepted eye, the one who investigates and discovers the ultimate truth, emptiness, the Buddha, and so forth, completely disappeared. No, it hasn't. The accepted eye is always there. The accepted eye, she puts it in quotation marks. So I guess she means the conventional eye, the one that is accepted. No, it only disappears when we reflect on its emptiness. Because we cannot do both. Take on a conventional object and know its lack of inherent existence at the same time. We can't do both. If it's a conventional object, we cannot take to mind its ultimate uh, truth. But that's just because our mind, that's just because our mind, every time um, a conventional object appears, it appears as inherently existent. And so if then at the same time we take its emptiness to mind, that is its lack of inherent existence, well, it can't do both. Our mind, it's impossible for our mind um, that one object, such as the self, appears inherently and not inherently, right? So if, it, if the self appears, it always appears inherently. That's just because of the imprints in our mind. And if that same object were to also with that same mind would to realize the lack of inherent existence of that of that self of that i then the lack of inherent existence would also appear and then it appears inherently and not inherently that's contradictory therefore the i doesn't appear at all it disappears so you only realize the lack of inherent existence of that i it's on the basis of the i so only the the emptiness of the i appears the eye doesn't appear in that moment. So in that moment, it's there, it's not there to that mind, but it doesn't mean the eye has disappeared. Okay. So therefore the eye is always there. It's, it's the merely labeled eye. Like I said before, when it comes to the eye, it's that which we label, for instance, my hand moves, I label I move. My body, my my, my body aches, I say I feel. Achy, or my 
mental consciousness thinks, I say, I think. My eye consciousness sees, I say, I see. If you were to remove these labels, I see or I, you wouldn't find any entity separate. There is no separate I that does all that other than the one that is just labeled. But based on that labeling, being labeled, it still exists as a merely labeled phenomenon. That's true for the physical objects. You know, like when we say there's a table, well, I touch the table. You you touch some part that is not the table. You touch a corner, but based on touching that corner, I label, I touch the label. Based on seeing an object, and I only see one side, I don't see the other side, I say, I see a table, a label table, right? Based on what appears to my mind. And that's that's all there is to the table, that label table, whether I talk of it, as appearing to my mind or me touching it and so forth, there is, if you were to remove that label table, there wouldn't be a table. Okay, so the same is true for the I. So does it overcome the change? Does that self and holds the self in a wider, deeper and experiential way? Does the self, has it disappeared? No, it hasn't disappeared, it's there. Does it hold the self? Yes, because it's merely labeled. I mean, it doesn't hold itself as much as it exists because it's labeled. So it doesn't hold itself. We do say it holds its own entity. We say any phenomenon that exists holds its own entity. But that's not saying that there's a separate thing that holds itself. It's just a conventional, it's just a way of of speaking that a self is a self right? Although it's merely labeled. So in that way, because it is a self as a self, an eye as an eye, a uh, table as a table and so forth. So therefore we say the table holds its own tableness, right? But it's not an inherent tableness, but it's rather labeled. There seems to be a division between conventional eye and ultimate eye. What is the ultimate? There's no ultimate eye. There's no ultimate eye. I mean, there's only a conventional eye. And the ultimate eye, if that were to exist, it would be ultimately existent. It's that which we which we uh, refute. So there's only a conventional, there's only a, a merely labeled eye. There's not an absolute eye that exists in and of itself. So there's a division between conventional and ultimate eye. Yeah, because one exists and one doesn't. And that conventional eye explores and meditates and understands emptiness. But she says, according to my intuition, it's the same as a two-faced coin, conventional and ultimate. Oh, if you mean with ultimate, the ultimate truth of the eye. But the ultimate truth of the eye is not the ultimate eye. All right. So when you talk about ultimate eye, it doesn't exist. But there's the ultimate truth of the eye, which is really just the lack of the I existing inherently. Our mind just adds that existence of like this characteristic that the I exists very concrete and in and of itself, whereas it doesn't. And so the fact that it doesn't, that is the ultimate nature of the I. It's the actual nature of the I that is merely labeled and doesn't exist in and of itself. So who's the investigator and who's the one who understands the ultimate self? Well, as I said, the ultimate self doesn't exist, but the ultimate truth of the self, that exists. So who's the investigator? Who's the one who understands it? Well, it's the conventional I. Conventional in the sense that my mind, okay, the I, the the mind, it investigates, it understands how the self really exists. It understands the ultimate nature of the self. And so that mind understanding it, I label, I understand. I understand how the self exists. I label that on the basis of the mind doing so. So is there a separate I other than the merely labeled one that I label on the basis of consciousness? No, no. We always want something. 
And then we suffer, she says. How do we know that what that that we want to know what bodhicitta and emptiness, if in the end it will bring more suffering? Well, I think I answered that before. Just try. Try if you, you know, practice it, more bodhicitta and emptiness. And you know, initially it's difficult, but of course, based on an understanding of what bodhicitta really is based on love and compassion and so forth, well, bringing more love and compassion into your life is there more happiness and taking it further to take on the responsibility of wanting to benefit, I mean, the welfare of other sentient beings. If you, The more you bring that into your own life, do you feel better? Just try it out. And how about emptiness? I mean, I'm not saying nothingness. Of course, emptiness, which doesn't refer to phenomena existing inherently, but it does not, also does not refer to phenomena being totally non-existent, but instead phenomena being merely labeled without existing in and of itself. So that is true for anything in life, myself and others and so forth. So based on that understanding, our attachment and anger and so forth, are they slightly reduced? And if yes, do you feel happier? Okay, then you know from there and you continue from there and take a little more and a little more. You know, it's like anything else. You know, if you do yoga, for instance, to give you an example. So some people find yoga very beneficial. So how do you know? Okay, just because some yoga instructor tells you it's good, kind of saying, well, you know, come to my class. Of course, the person would want him or her would want us to come to the class because we pay for them. So, of course, we can't know 100% it's good for us. So just try it. Do a little bit. Do you feel better? Okay, do a little bit more. But, of course, again, balance with wisdom is important. Don't, don't sell all your stuff and just move into a cave and don't do anything. And that's extreme. That won't work. In a balanced way, right? Okay, as long as you enjoy it, do it as long as you enjoy it. And if you feel like, oh, I want to do something else, well, let it go, do something else, and then come back to it. Okay. Then the second one, why samsara exists and for what? Might as well just go into it. Okay, if human existence is so full of suffering, why does it exist in this way? How does it not exist in a better state? What is the Buddhist explanation for why we're not born with at least a bodhisattva state of mind? Yeah, right. <laughs> I want to complain. Why was I not born at least with bodhicitta? If I could choose, I'd be born with bodhicitta and an enlightened mind in the first place. Yeah, totally. Uh, does Chodakiti's text mention or explain this? No. Unfortunately, this is, I mean, the question is a question that arises, of course, based on the Abrahamic faith we were raised in. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Um, so, of course, there's much more of a sense God brought us into this world. God has, there's a meaning for us. There's a, or there's a purpose why we're, for instance, you know, the whole story, of course, that all three Abrahamic faith, um, they they um, assert this, that we are in the state we're in right now because we were uh, thrown out of paradise, right? Well, in Buddhism, you don't find an equal story like that. It's just like, there's no reason for that. It's not like there's a purpose. I mean, a purpose, we can make our life purposeful by acting according to reality, the interdependence of all phenomena, and therefore are loving and kind towards others and give others what we wish, you know, don't do upon others what we don't want to be done on us kind of idea on the basis of that, to be loving and so forth. And that way we give our life meaning. But why are we born in this way? That is like um, asking, why is there God? Why? Why is there God? Why is it just one God? Why not 10, right? I mean, like taking this, taking it from the point of view of, of the, the of Judaism or Christianity and so forth, why is there God? It's just it, just God just is. Or why is there just one? Because just is. I mean, there's no real answer. Why do, moving away from that. So why do things change? Um, why is there impermanence? 
why is there why is this world round why is it not squared well then we say because the causes and conditions were such that it became round but why were the causes and conditions such that it became round right and you can go on endlessly so it just is in buddhism it's like human existence is full of suffering why because of ignorance why is there ignorance it's just there it's always been there why do I have ignorance now? Because there was ignorance in my previous life. Why am I not at least born with bodhicitta in my mind? Because I didn't develop it. Bodhicitta I didn't develop it. No, so not in this life and not in my previous life and not before that. It was just, you know, and you can go on endlessly. But unfortunately, um, yeah, we can't really give an answer. There's no answer to that. And it is asked, this question is asked uh, again and again. Why? What is the origin of all this? Where does my... No beginning. But there's an end. So who cares what's before? There's an end. I think that's the good news, right? We can get liberated from it. All right. Then Jimmy's got another question. Oh, is it still the dream body? Oh, yes, I answered that. So the dream body, there's a lot about dreams this today. Um, is our dream body based on subtle energies? Yeah, I would think so. If yes, it's the same as an emanation body. No, I've once already answered that. Emanating seems to not be so much physical, but rather a kind of mental activity. Well, it's due to the mental activity and the physical energy wins. So could our dream body be perhaps be emanated by our mind? Well, our mind uh is responsible for the dream body but it hasn't emanated like i wouldn't use the word emanate because it's not this controlled kind of process uh to take on a body to be born what is the difference between those two situations is there any difference at all in all my dreams in 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 my dreams the dream people usually have the convention among them that they are born at least in my dreams they do it seems to parallel with our ordinary everyday waking experience of people having the convention among them of being born. Um, I'm not sure I understand this correctly. What is the difference between those two situations? Is there any difference at all? Um, are they born? So dream body physical or is it mind only? I think I've, I've, I've heard that it is physical. There's an actual dream body, but I'm not sure it manifests during every dream. Sometimes it may just be an appearance to the to the mind, but in other cases there may be actual in dream body. If it is mind only, if it's only appearing to a mind, then our ordinary bodies should also be mind only, only appearances, because the process is exactly the same. If they're not mind only, then why should we also say that dream bodies are physical too? Um, well. The thing is, like, in a dream body, my understanding, and I don't really know, as I said, better to ask someone who's qualified to answer this, but just to give you my limited opinion of, of this, well, it comes from the subtle energy, subtle energy winds, through that the, the body manifests. Or, for instance, um, similarly, a, 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 an intermediate state being, also, they have this subtler type of body, and that's from the subtle energy winds. But our body, our physical body, when we're reborn, well, there's a physical entity, let's say the fertilized egg uh, of our mother, to which our mind connects. So it doesn't come from our energy winds, but it rather it's rather it's this uh, through our karmic connection with our parents. Therefore, our mind is connects with this 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 fertilized egg in the beginning in the case of a human birth in the in a like yeah being born as a human being and therefore we connect with that and connecting with that object then uh, our mind due to the karmic force we connect with this fertilized egg and from now on think this is my body of course in the beginning with the I, I don't think you, your mind sits in that fertilized egg going my egg my egg I don't think there's this conscious thought yet no no uh, but there's still this connection has been made so there's a subtle type of mental consciousness that enters of course the fertilized egg initially and then grows 
until a coarser mind is actually functioning, you need to also have a physical basis for a coarser mind to function. And then there's the coarser thought when the body is fully ready, there's the sense perception of the body, there's the thought, I, I, my body. Okay, so th- you find this uh, again and again in the scriptures, you know, like we got used to thinking this is my body and any kind of sensation to associate it with my body. But that's just this, the force of familiarity because I had enough time from being in the womb of my mother until I was born, etc., to feel my, my, my body. But then when I die and I'm born as a little dog, well, then I'll be thinking this little fluffy kind of thing if i'm going to be a fluffy dog you know this fluffy body that's my body right so we get used to that but it's not about this body coming from my subtle energy as in the case of the dream body or um the intermediate state so that's different uh being born can you stop being born Yes, when you when you attain, I mean, being born right now, being born, rebirth, rebirth is associated in in Tibetan Buddhism, or in, in Buddhism, or the, the, well, in the word that is used in Tibetan, at least, uh, it connotes. Usually, it has the meaning of being born under the control of karma and affliction. So, this uncontrolled, there's no controlled. There's no control in that case. So when we when we die until the moment we're reborn, it just happens beyond our control. It's not like, oh, that parents are like, those two I don't like. I'm gonna wait a few days until you know I find the right parents. It doesn't work that way. It's like um it's the force of karma that throws us into a particular existence. And when that's when does that stop? We're no longer under the control of karma and afflictions. So when we've eliminated afflictions um, in general. I personally don't remember of having been born and I don't know anyone who remembers their own birth. The idea of having been born seems to me like someone who has never tasted food, but have seen only others eating food and have read a lot about eating food and thinks that he knows everything about food, but never has actually tasted food. No, they just don't remember having eaten food. So I think you can compare to someone, we, we just don't know, remember, now I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't even remember what I had for lunch three years ago on the exact same day. Um, I still had lunch uh, on that day, I'm pretty sure, where I ate something on that day, even though I don't remember what it was. So we just don't remember, but we were aware in that moment, I mean, the baby is aware that you know, usually are screaming or, or crying. Uh, so there's definitely awareness. Anyway, uh, another fault that would arise if we were born is that, for example, some person who has been born intains in that same lifetime the first boomy and the subsequent boomies would start emanating his own body uh, and other bodies and would stop being born. Oh, um say we are born i mean we're i would say we are born born just means well birth is usually strictly speaking birth means connecting with uh with a physical entity so in the case of being born human uh conception is sometimes described as birth it's not necessarily the birth from a womb although it's also used in that context it can be it can refer to the birth of the from the womb so there's definitely awareness of that because the baby is definitely an emotional response to that uh and then with regard to conception yeah i'm pretty sure there's a certain type of awareness i mean there's always some awareness but what is that really entail what that means i have no idea like i said like he says also we don't remember anyway so just because we don't remember of course in the end it's very hard to prove and there's one of those hidden phenomena that well eventually we'll come to realize of course firsthand but for now we can just take it on faith really but of course faith based on reasoning uh, because it doesn't make sense anyway so in the same life so the first boomy and the boomy so if you were attain these different boomies in this lifetime so you realize emptiness directly um well, yeah, you start emanating 
uh, you start emanating, you have start emanating different bodies and you're no longer born, he says here. Well, in general, like I said, birth usually refers to birth through karma and afflictions. But in general, but then in the case of a bodhisattva, once you reach the path of seeing, well, you, you don't undergo ordinary rebirth in, in samsara. Uh, you still talk about birth as in like through love and compassion um so it's the, the trigger that which triggers our birth is love and compassion um but it's like if it's a manifest if it's just an emanation you're not really going through birth you just look like it so it's like you emanate that you manifest that but you're not going through actual birth so here it becomes really complicated i mean said that once you reach the path of seeing it's no longer through the power of affliction and karma but through the power of um compassion and, and prayer yeah i don't know I, this is really difficult um uh, yeah so it's once you once you realize emptiness directly it's no longer this ordinary bath so can you tell us your opinion? Oh, these really long questions. Honestly, the assertion that right now we are born seems straight. Right now we're not born, I would say, without any evidence other than hearsay convention as explained above. Uh, seems more reasonable to say our minds are emanating our bodies right now. I, I, I think this is so mine only as in like, um, if it's still Jimmy asking this question, then I think it's pretty much thinking there's, there's only mind. His questions are often uh, influenced by mind only, but according to the Prasangika school, um, there is something called physical and there's something mental and it's not mind only. Um, it's not that there is no physical world. And so it's not like we emanate a body. Anyway, I've already said that. Um, okay, so now it's 7.30. I've answered most questions, I believe. Uh, I think Varda's question I haven't answered yet. There's two or three questions left. Um, so if you'd like, we can have another session. Yeah, I want to answer all your questions. So let's have another session. You see already it's different. Uh, we have we don't have a meditation because it's really just answering questions. Once I start the new course, of course, we go back to the uh, old format. But yeah, for today, it should be enough. You're welcome to send more questions to Dalit. I'll answer all the ones that I haven't answered today and those who come first next time. And next time is definitely the last time we meet. Um, and as I announced before, and I think Leora wants to say something about that as well, but we'll have a break of one month before we continue with another text. So Leora, please go ahead before we dedicate. Okay. Leora, to say hey, thank you, Geshema. Uh, I'm afraid I won't be able to come next week. So I would like to thank you so much for this unbelievable two years course. How lucky we are those who attend it and those who are uh, having the privilege to watch it or listen to it in youtube or recorded uh, video uh, we went through this uh, important uh, text by chandra kirti and um, i don't know how many people in the in, in the world have this privilege uh, to have this uh, detailed course for two years with such a perfect teacher. Thank you so much, Geshema. We feel so lucky, such a joy. And uh, it's really uh, some unbelievable karma we all share to be able to participate in this course. And at the beginning of the course, Geshema uh, taught us that um, um, Chandrakirti's text is, uh, is giving explanation based on Nagarjuna uh, text. 
um, not repeating the same arguments, but adding to it. Nagarjuna text is uh, older and, most, and more difficult to understand. So we are so, um, we're so fortunate to have this text studied first as a base for the next course in which Geshema is so kind, has so kind agreed to teach us on a Nagarjuna text as uh, Geshema mentioned uh, last week, Mula Madhya Karika, the uh, fundamental wisdom of the middle way. And uh, so we are equipped with a very good basis and uh, not, it's, uh, no, not that it's going to be easy, but easier. So, but, and also it will be a long-term course. Um, so we are very, very, very lucky. Geshema, thank you so much for your kindness. Um, it will take a month or so before it starts. So we have a break and it will probably uh, will be given on Mondays, I believe. Uh, but we'll, we'll announce the details when we have them with some explanation uh, on the new uh, course. And uh, so if I'm not able to uh, participate next week, I will certainly listen to the answers uh, recorded. But uh, thank you all so very much for taking part in this course. Dalit, thank you so much. I also thanks Sheer and Tom before Dalit. We all took part in, in, in the, the, the board of the, uh, DFI. Um, and first and most of all, Geshema is so appreciative. Thank you so much for this amazing course. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Leora. And thank you, of course, also Dalit and everyone else share and forget all the people who were involved, of course. Um, one thing I want to stress though, what we did here together, um, I cannot really give you a good understanding of this text. So therefore, that was just studying this text together. And you, you really need to find a qualified teacher. Now you've got some introduction and hopefully with a qualified, a good teacher, you can then get a good understanding of this text. And the same is true for the next text. Uh, the, yeah, the next text. I don't feel qualified um, I'm not teaching this we're just working together through the text we're discussing it we're studying it together and then you should uh, find a qualified teacher who can teach this to you anyway um, I just want to stress this and I'll stress it again as we go along so this is really just we're studying together but um, yeah so I'll say a little bit more about uh, maybe two or three words next time about um the text itself well not that much but yeah so for today i think we can leave it at that as i said if you have more questions you can send them in we have one more class and that's it and then yeah a month break and they'll continue oh and uh yeah anyway i can say anything about the timing etc we can discuss next time all right so let's just take uh, a short moment to of course, once again, dedicate all the virtue we have accumulated as a group. Having studied Chandakirti's text, and of course, having come together to answer some, to ask some questions and uh, think about these questions, listen to the answers, etc. So may this become a cause for us to eliminate all the defilements on our mind so that we attain the all-knowing state of a Buddha. And in that way, be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. May all this merit we've accumulated also become a cause for our lamas 
may it cause our lamas to have an extremely long life. As long as the Dalai Lama and all the other great masters. May we have a long and healthy life so that they continue to guide us through their example and through their teachings. May all the merit we've accumulated, may all this make a difference right here and right now to all the endless beings around us. May Gishu Punsok and Tali Lubin quickly get better, recover from their illness, and may everyone else who's ill mentally, physically, may they soon recover. May our virtue and more peace in this world reduce the conflict, reduce all the suffering, especially as expressed by Shantideva. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, Attain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find fruit. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. <clears throat> May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, May they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. See you again next time, next week. All right. Bye. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Gashama.